Do you know elephants try to cover their just-born babies in sand and dirt by rolling them over and kicking the dirt? The motive behind this is very fascinating. Let's understand. This elephant is giving birth after carrying the baby for two years in the womb. Once the baby comes out, all the elephants gather around and surround the baby for protection. This is something they naturally do when one of them gives birth. After a few seconds, the mother elephant starts to roll the baby in the sand and dirt by gently kicking it. This is done to hide the scent of the baby from potential predators and also to protect the baby from the sunlight since the newborns have very delicate and sensitive skin. Another fun fact about baby elephants, they suck their trunk for comfort just like human newborns suck their thumbs. Here you can see a honey badger is caught by a python. But you don't have to feel sorry for the honey badger here. Instead, save it for the python. Honey badgers are one of the most savage and badass animals. It wouldn't be wrong to call them psychopaths. They simply don't care how big, fast, strong, or intimidating the other party is when it comes to a fight. In the wild, you can often see them taking on lions, cheetahs, and other animals that are much stronger and bigger in size. The main possible reason behind their ferocity is that they have very few natural predators in the wild, and their thick, loose skin can withstand bee stings, porcupine quills, and most of the animal bites. This allows them to interact with other animals with literally no fear at all. And to top it all, they are also immune to snake venom. Thank God their average lifespan is only 24 years. Do you know how mysterious the KV-6 tank is? It was a super heavy tank designed by the Soviet Union during World War II and was fitted with three turrets, each with its own unique weaponry, mortars, cannons and Kadusha rockets. It was a combination of several tanks, namely the T-60, BT-5, T-38, KV-1 and KV-2 tanks. Its main turret is from the KV-2 tank and is armed with a 152mm gun. In front of and behind the main turret were two turrets from KV-1 tanks, but it had some differences, namely the turret in front had a turret for a 20mm gun from AT-60 tank in addition to the 76mm gun already mounted. The rear turret is also very unusual in that it houses the BM-13 multiple rocket launcher or Katyusha. According to some sources, the KV-6 may also have a turret from AT-38 tank with two 7.62mm general-purpose machine guns, located between the center and the front turret. As for the dimensions of this tank, they are even more shocking, reaching a length of 22 meters, a width of 3.7 meters and a weight of 138 tons. This tank had powerful armor and weapons used to defend against the German Tiger and Leopard tanks. However, there is still controversy about the existence and authenticity of the KV-6 tank, with some believing it to be a fictional project, a model created to cover up a real development, or simply an unconfirmed or unreliable source of information. There is very limited information on the KV-6 tank, with the main sources being circumstantial and confined to photographs and drawings in archives. However, these sources exist in bizarre and incomplete ways and much information about the KV-6 remains a mystery. The person who invented the Z-shaped single-arm pantograph is truly a genius. When the train is traveling at high speeds, the pantograph can always closely adhere to the high-voltage power line, and it doesn't require any electronic components to control. How does such a pantograph work? As shown in the diagram, the single arm pantograph consists of a base, two support arms, and a contact head. The requirement is that no matter how the support arm swings up and down, the contact head must always remain horizontal. How is this achieved? Look closely. We circle the lower arm of the pantograph and you can see that it is a four bar linkage. When the green long bar is lifted up, the angle of the yellow short bar will also change. Next, we extend the yellow short bar and attach the contact head. The contact head's vertical movement can be controlled by the four bar linkage. But there's another problem. The height change will inevitably bring about a change in the angle of the contact head, causing insufficient contact between the contact head and the overhead wire. So what do we do? It's simple. Add another balancing rod, like this. It connects to the short bar under the contact head, ensuring that the contact head is always horizontal. The entire device just utilizes a perfect combination of mechanics without any electronic components. Due to the very high voltage received by the pantograph, it also needs to be connected to the carriage using insulators. This is the fastest money-making job I've ever seen. 
Changing a light bulb can earn you 130,000, and you only need to change it twice a year. That is to say, you can earn 260,000 in two changes. What kind of job can make so much money? It's the tower light changer. Actually, this is not an ordinary light bulb. Not everyone can do it. This is a special job at high altitudes, specifically for changing light bulbs on signal towers over 600 meters tall. These signal towers are not like ordinary towers. In terms of appearance, it is made up of a single metal frame. It gets thinner as it goes up, and there are no protective measures. You rely solely on a rope around you. If you're not careful and fall, it means death. So not everyone can do this job. First, you can't be afraid of heights. Otherwise, before you even climb to the top, you would be too scared and your legs would give out. You also need to be physically fit, because it's not as simple as climbing a ladder at home. You need to climb step by step. Professionals take about three hours to climb from the ground to the top. That's at least six hours round trip. So you need a lot of stamina. And the wind speed at the top can reach nearly 100 kilometers per hour. If you can't hold on, it's dangerous. Although you can earn 130000 for a trip, the money is not easy to earn. After all, you're risking your life. If you fall, there's basically no chance of survival. So not many people take on this profession. So, if it were you, would you dare to take this job? While I possess immortality and am challenging to be killed, this is also one of my misfortunes. Human beings, in their quest to unravel the secret of my death and rebirth, have resorted to cruel methods, including severing our limbs for research to determine if humans can achieve immortality. I have endured countless physical and psychological torments as a result. Hello, I am one of the oldest amphibians, sometimes referred to as a four-legged snake or salamander. We are known to inhabit warm freshwater regions and marshes. However, it was in 1768 when a doctor accidentally discovered the secret of my regenerating limbs, which can regrow even after being severed. From this point, my unfortunate life took a tragic turn. Humans subjected us to various inhumane experiments, including studying our regenerative abilities. This even extended to assessing our market value, and some of us had to endure organ removal procedures, including our hearts. Most tragically, a portion of my fellow salamanders didn't succumb to these experiments, but instead, after 70 days, regenerated, only to be subjected to further torment. After sacrificing numerous salamander comrades, you finally discovered the secret of our regeneration. This ability is attributed to the presence of immune cells called macrophages within my body. When an injury occurs, these immune cells rapidly migrate to the wounded area, where they divide and share their memory. I'm left bewildered by your actions, driven by the desire for immortality, and your readiness to subject us to relentless pain. Is this method truly justifiable for achieving eternal life? The train braking process is amazing. Underneath each carriage are two bogies, one containing four wheels. Next, the whole process of disc braking is introduced, the core of which is the compressor installed in the front part of the car, which looks simple, but in fact, it is not complicated at all. The screw compressors at each end are driven by a center motor, and the braking air comes out of a green pipe. The other white brake pipe transports the compressed air to the storage tank underneath each compartment. Before the air enters the tank, it passes through three important valves, the first two of which are service valves and traps. To prevent the gas from flowing back, a check valve is installed at the end. The gas will be filled at a pressure of 6 kg per square centimeter. The water from the storage tank next to it is used for toilet flushing and can be ignored here. When the gas flows into the brake cylinder, it also passes through the distribution valve in front of you, to which you can see the green pipe above, with a pressure of 5 kg. Until the brakes are applied, these gases inhibit the piston from moving downward. When the driver presses the brake pedal, the pressure inside the tank will lift the piston upward, and then the gas inside the pipe will come to the brake cylinder. When the diaphragm inside is squeezed, the brake pads bite into the wheels and the vehicle brakes slowly. After the train is fully braked, the cylinder is like pulling up the handbrake cannot be moved. Instead, the pressure in the cylinders must be released in order to start the train. Going back to the distributor valve, now by raising the air pressure in the green pipe and pressing the piston down, the excess gas will be relieved from the pipe in the middle of the piston. Combined with the return spring on the brake cylinder, 
the brakes can be fully released. Teach you how to fly an F-18 in two minutes. Enter the cockpit. Start by turning on the main power supply and releasing the ejection seat safety. Activate the auxiliary power unit, APU. Turn the switch to the right to start the right engine. When the RPM, revolutions per minute, exceeds 20%, move the right throttle to idle. Then, open the bleed air valve. Next, turn on the left and right digital displays, odd screen, and the multifunction color display, FCD. Click the manual and SCS buttons on the left display in sequence to clear any warnings. Set the inertial navigation system to ground mode. Turn on the radar system and set it to working mode. Now turn the switch to the left to start the left engine. Again, when RPM exceeds 20%, Move the left throttle to idle. Set the wings to full auto. Hold the flight control system self-test switch and click the right display's SCS button twice to perform a flight control self-test. Set the wings to half auto. Set the arresting hook to airport mode. Reset the flight control system and reset the takeoff frequency. Open the cockpit oxygen supply and close the cockpit canopy. Set the inertial navigation system to nav mode. Unlock the backup attitude indicator. Click the manual and SCS buttons on the right side display to activate radar altitude warnings. Turn on the radar warning receiver and chaff dispenser. Set the electronic countermeasures to stand by. Activate the IFF, identification friend or foe, and take on. Tactical air navigation systems. Turn on the helmet sight. Finally, release the brakes and slide down the runway. You are ready for takeoff. Did you learn how to do it?